started for today. Uh, welcome everybody to the next installation of GameRT's Learn and Play series. I am Rebecca Strang, the current GameRT president. I'm a children's librarian at Naperville Public Library in the western suburb of Chicago. And today I'm here for tech and Q&A support. Um, this event is being recorded. The recording will be available to GameRT members for six months before becoming publicly available on the GameRT website. We are also live streaming this session to Twitch. So hello to any of our Twitch viewers out there. The Twitch video on demand will be accessible after that six month members only period as well. And if you're not following GameRT on Twitch already, please give us a follow so we can build up that channel. I'll have some links in chat for you guys soon. For anybody who's not previously familiar with GameRT, we are the Games and Gaming Roundtable of the American Library Association. Our mission is to promote gaming in libraries, whether that's programming, collection development, community building, prototyping, playtesting, research, all of that. We love games and libraries. Um, GameRT has two professional development series, a webinar series and a learn and play series. And these events Healthy usually Delta. alternate each month. Let me uh, mute some folks here. <laughs> Um, so today we have our learn and play session on Twine, and soon I'll be handing over things to our speaker for that presentation. But first, I want to let you know about some of our upcoming events. And we'll have links in the slot in the chat for these two soon. So on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday on July 26th at 1 p.m. Central, we have To Build a Mystery, a panel on how to create a virtual mystery hunt for your own library. And that is gonna be run by the folks who did the mystery hunts for LibLearnX and ALA Annual. So you'll hear from them how they built those hunts and how you can build something similar for your own library. Then on August 10th at 12 p.m. Central, we're going to have a beginning a circulating RPG collection webinar. We'll have a registration link for that soon. And then coming up uh, also in August, on August 30th at 2 p.m. Central, we have another partnership with the Film and Media Roundtable. We're going to be running a webinar called New Realities, New Horizons, Augmented and Virtual Reality in Libraries, Classrooms, and Development. So those are some of our immediately upcoming events. Um, some other fun news that I wanna share with you is that we're also going to start streaming some live plays on the Twitch channel starting next month. Uh, Danielle Costello and Russell Brandon are gonna be working on developing a fun streaming schedule for our Twitch channel. So definitely keep an eye out on GameRT spaces for date announcements, potential player recruitments and other fun Twitch news. And then anybody looking for information on running RPGs in your libraries can join the GameRT RPG Guild to get experience playing and running RPGs with your library peers. And I'll have a link to that Discord server in the chat later as well. So now I think we've had plenty of announcements. We'll get on with today's presentation. There will be a Q&A uh, section at the end of the presentation portion. So if you can hold your questions to the end, I will try to catch any that come up in chat, but I am human. I may miss some of those. So if you can hold questions until the Q&A portion, we will get to those then. Um, but for now, let's please welcome Amber Sewell. Amber is a teaching and learning librarian at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. She is interested in games and storytelling for instruction and how instructional design and creativity can create engaging and effective learning experiences. She incorporates gaming into her work whenever possible, including designing short games for classroom use, working on cyber or murder mystery events, and more. As a gamer herself, she's a big fan of board games, running a virtual cat cafe, and playing D&D &D whenever she can find a local group. So thank you so much for presenting for us today, Amber. I will hand things over to you.
All right, unmuted. Thank you, Rebecca, for that introduction. And thank you all for joining me today for this learn and play about twine. Um, I threw the link to the slides in chat. Um, the bit.ly will also be on every slide, so don't worry if you don't catch it. Um, so the plan for today is to introduce myself and twine, um, talk about maybe why you should consider using it, what you can use it for. Um, we'll, I will demo how you use it, and so hopefully you'll get a chance to start creating twine on your own, or at least finding some fun games to play, um, and then have a spot for questions. So as Rebecca said, hi, uh, my name is Amber Sewell and I'm a teaching and learning librarian at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, I'm also a member at large for Game RT, which is exciting. Um, I'm always happy to chat about games, twine or otherwise, among a host of other topics. So please feel free to reach out if you have questions or just want to chat. Um, I've got my email address up there and my Twitter handle. So to kind of talk about what is Twine, um, from their website, Twine is an open source tool for telling interactive nonlinear stories. Um, it's a very open definition because there are a lot of different things you can do with Twine. Um, I first found it in summer of 2020. Um, I read this article by Evanson and Hare where they created a super short um, Twine game um, to teach students about information privilege. And so you were a student who had graduated and lost institutional access and you needed scholarly resources. So how did you find those? Um, a couple of months later, um, I was trying to brainstorm. I was liaison to first year seminar at the University of Tennessee, um, Knoxville. Um, and I needed to give them an orientation, but I knew some students were gonna be comfortable going on campus. Some students were not. I was not gonna be on campus. Um, so choose your own adventure style orientation sounded like the best way to kind of allow students to explore what options were relevant to them. Um, and I remember Twine and got started. Um, but because Twine can be a lot of things and it's kind of hard to talk about it in the abstract, um, I created a really short demo game um, for you all to play to kind of get a sense of what Twine is, how it plays as a player. Um, so if you've got the slides up, you can click this play button. I will drop the link in chat. Um, and I'll set just like a three minute timer. Um, and uh, take three minutes to kind of play through just to get a sense of what Twine is and what it can look like. And if you have any problems accessing it, let me know in chat. Oh yes, Liz, thank you. That was a problem we ran into uh, for LibLearnX. Yeah, Jessica, you can add images. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but images, sound, videos, uh, you can definitely add those.
All right, so that is just a quick demonstration of one way to use twine. Um, I have plenty more examples, so I'm happy to show you more later. Um, but I find it's helpful to let people actually experience twine before I dive into my pitch for twine, um, which is my next part. So why use twine? Um, one of the first things is accessibility. Um, I've put together a Google folder of resources that I've found helpful that I'll share at the end. Um, and one of those things is the Interactive Fiction Accessibility Report, where they talk about twine and any accessibility issues. Um, and what they found is that it's largely as accessible as any standard website, since it is an HTML file. Um, as a creator, the things that you need to keep in mind are like color contrast, what fonts you use, um, and if you do add images to make sure you are adding alt text to those images. Um, those are the only things that I've needed to worry about um, with my basic level of twine usage. Um, it's really easy to get started, which hopefully you all will see in a couple of minutes. I believe that like if you were using this for programming, you could get up and give a five minute introduction to twine and then let your patrons go start to create their own stories. Uh, it's open source and easily shareable. Um, I know with a lot of people I've talked with as librarians, Sometimes we are one of the few or sometimes the only person who's interested in games um, and has the interest and time to devote to creating games. Um, so it's really nice that this is easily shareable. Um, any of the games I've created, I'm happy to share the HTML file with you and I will show you at the end how to import that. So then you have that game yourself to kind of tweak as it suits your needs. Um, I really like the second person narrative structure. Um, I feel like that is a great way to kind of immerse stories in the learning context. Um, it's really helpful for like situational learning. It's as interactive as you want to make it. Um, the demo, you know, asked for your name, so you can use it throughout the game. Um, you can check answers and inventory. Um, there are much more interactive twine games out there. This is just the basic level that I'm at. Um, and then it gives your players agency, which is really important from a game design standpoint, but also from an instructional standpoint, allowing your players, your, your students to feel like they have control over where they're going um, can be really important. So what can you use it for? Um, tons of stuff. You can use it for instruction. Um, you can use it for low stakes decision making. One of the example games I've got is um, a presentation that was given at LOEX where they created um, an information literacy twine game that was really cool. Um, you can use it to delve into processes. So for the orientation, I walked students through how to use our discovery tool. Um, and I was really concerned that it was going to be really boring because it was just like a series of screenshots with kind of minimal interactivity. Um, but students said they really appreciated having a more complex process broken down into a series of screenshots that they could pull up and follow on their own. Um, and you can also use it to explore affective concepts like Evanson and Hare using it to explore open access and information privilege. Obviously, you can use it for orientation to spaces and services. That's how I started out using Twine. Um, you can use it as outreach, so your patrons become the storytellers. Um, I'm really interested to facilitate one of these outreach events. I think it would be really neat um, whether you're doing it as a researcher to kind of see like, oh, how do students lay out the research process? Where did they have questions? Where did they have decisions they needed to make? And what would things have looked like if they chose differently? Um, you can also go with themes. So we have a large first generation population here at UNLV. And I think it would be really cool to hold an outreach event where they wrote a twine story about what that has been like, how it's impacted their college experience. Um, you can also use it for training and professional development. Um, this is really good, like scenario-based training. Um, I've got some examples of people who've used it for that as well. So to talk about using Twine for outreach, um, kind of basic steps, you create your outreach plan. So your theme, who your audience is gonna be, 
how much time you're going to spend. Twine is definitely one of those um, tools that I think, given what audience you're working with, you could have people who you give them an hour and they're like, I am not even close to done, um, depending on whether they got swept up with um, exploring different codes, whether they were looking at like, how do I tweak the appearance to be exactly the aesthetic I want, or they just got caught up in like the freedom of being able to construct a narrative based on decision making. Um, I would recommend having a quick guide to Twine for your users. Um, like I said, I think you could give a fairly quick demonstration and that would be good, but just having something for them to reference as they go along. Um, I really like the Twine cookbook. They have a section that is just creating your first story that walks you through all the basic steps you need to know. Um, then you go to twinery.org and opt to use it online and you can get going with it. Next, I wanted to briefly talk about using Twine to meet objectives, whether this is using Twine for instruction, if you're using it for outreach, so say you want patrons to play a fun game, but also learn more about a new collection that you've curated, um, or if you're creating this for training and professional development. There are a couple of, there are five steps to this. Um, backward design is something that I'm a huge advocate for when designing games. Um, prototyping or storyboarding is especially important when using Twine because the back end, especially the first couple of games you make can kind of get confusing. Um, actually building the thing in Twine. And then the last two steps are implementation and assessment, which I'm not gonna really talk as much about during the talking portion of this, but if you have questions, please feel free to ask me about that um, at the end. So I mentioned I'm a huge advocate for backward design for games. Um, when I first started talking about this in the context of Twine, I was looking for like a worksheet that broke these down to like simple steps for designing games for learning and I couldn't find any. So I made one. Um, it's a Google Doc that is in the Google folder that I'll share later. Um, it includes all of the steps from like I had an idea to how do I assess at the end, um, but I only wanted to touch on the first four points um, in the worksheet. So if you came to today's session and you're like, actually, I have a thing I would like to start and kind of use as a test during today's hands-on portion, um, you'd be ready. Um, so first is starting with your learning objectives. This is really important, even if your objective is just like, I want patrons to have fun and I want them to know about this new collection. Um, just knowing what your objectives are can be really helpful um, and making sure the tool is aligned to what you're trying to do. Um, sometimes Twine isn't going to be the best way to accomplish your learning objectives, um, but it can also be helpful as a designer, you know, if you're carried away with like having a fun story arc, but it doesn't necessarily fit those objectives, determining those from the outset can be really important. Um, next, I talk about use. So how is the game being used? Um, is this something where you are developing a game and then it lives asynchronously out on the web for people to interact with at any point? Is this something you're going to do in person? Um, and if so, are you wanting it to be, you know, digital or a tactile game? And once you've kind of determined how players are going to interact with your game, um, to think about assessment, um, you know, that's going to look very different if it's something you're just giving to departmental faculty and they're giving it to their students versus, you know, I can hand out a half sheet of paper with some questions on it in person. Um, and once you kind of know those, you can figure out what game mechanics make the most sense um, for your objectives and how you're assessing them. So, you know, if you're quizzing them, like quiz show mechanics can be fun. Um, if you're wanting students to really explore that choose your own adventure kind of vibe um, is where you're gonna go. Uh, but these are just important steps when I'm like, I wanna create a game for something that I go through first, even if I already know I wanna use Twine, this helps me keep the purpose in mind. Prototyping and storyboarding is something that I've found most intimidates people when I talk about this process. I think, you know, when you think of storyboarding, I think of like the shot by shot illustrated frames for a movie or a TV show, and it does not have to be that high fidelity. Um, I have some examples of prototypes and storyboards in that worksheet, um, but these are just examples of the prototype that I made for my first wine game. Um, the back end of that is way more complicated than this makes it look. Um, but the whole point of prototyping is just to be able to visualize your player's journey to make sure that you haven't forgotten anything, that the logic 
of the order of things make sense. Um, you should be able to hand this to somebody who's familiar with the process that you're walking through. They don't need to know it's for a game and they should be able to be like, oh, okay, I understand what you're asking people to do. Um, like I said, for twine, this is really important because the back end can get out of hand really quickly. Even for something as simple as the demo that I created, I'll still write down, you know, what order do I want to kind of showcase the different interactive elements that I incorporate um, and kind of how does that make sense with the story. So I've mentioned this Google folder of resources a lot. It is here. Um, I've got a link to it here and here and then I can drop that in the chat as well. Um, and this Google folder has a lot of resources I have accumulated. Um, I've taught myself everything about Twine as I go. Um, and so rather than teach a Twine and then send you off, I thought I would share all of the helpful sources that I've kind of accumulated over the last two years. Um, these include things like helpful links. So including um, the tutorials that I used, which was Adam Hammond's guide to Twine and his guide to HTML and CSS. Um, there are different ways to make your game publicly accessible once you've completed them. Um, just a couple of things that I've used as I've built my games and find myself referring back to. There are also sample games. Um, this is really just the most random collection of Twine games that I have created. Um, some of them were to show coworkers how to, like how twine could be used in an instructional um, situation. Some of them were just for fun. Um, I am happy to share the HTML file for any of those. If there's something you see that you're like, oh, that's cool. I'd like to be able to see how she did that. Happy to share those. Um, that's also where the HTML file for the demo game you played is. Um, and then I have examples of others using twine. Um, I'm a researcher, so anytime I come across anything in the literature where they're talking about using twine, I throw it into that document. Um, it's broken up by twine in libraries or academic libraries, twine in higher ed, and then twine elsewhere in the world. Um, if you are ever coming across something and you think I should add it to the list, throw it in there as a comment and I'll add it. And that is pretty much my pitch for Twine. Um, it's one of those things, the tool is so flexible, I didn't want to spend too much time um, giving different examples or diving too deeply in because uh, this is a broad audience, so you could want to use it for a lot of things. Um, before I kind of demo how you get started in Twine, um, are there any questions about Twine or its use? And feel free to put your questions in the chat, or if you want to speak over mic, just raise your hand and I can unmute you if it's easier to talk that way. Does anybody have any like brainstormy ideas so far of ways you might use this in your library? You can put that in chat too. Um, Liz Brown says this might be covered in the demo, but what but do you include wrong answers in your options? Um, are you talking about like when um, players choose the wrong answer or enter a wrong answer? I was thinking about when you're choosing the different outcomes that they can select while they're playing. <laughs> like, is there, uh, from the example you gave us, they, like there was no wrong answer. You just worked your way through the different stages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like I said, Twine is so flexible, you can do anything with it, but you could definitely, when you're presenting options to them, give them some that are wrong. Um, and you can write a little story snippet that's like, here's where you messed up. Or if it's like in an instructional sense, if you are offering um, to let students evaluate sources and choose what source works best for an assignment, um, offer them all the source types. And if they choose the wrong one, you could definitely include an explanation um, where you're like, here's why this doesn't work. Go back and try again. Um, definitely. Russell says this would be a fun way uh, to go through how to submit an ILL. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, definitely like choose your own adventure, Liz. <laughs> Jessica says wrong answer text can be really funny. 
Yeah, I'd like to say if you can think of it um, and you are willing to Google for as long as it takes to figure it out, you can do it in Twine. I say that and I've been struggling with figuring out how to link user input to Google Sheets for at least a year, but I will figure it out one day. All right, any other questions before Amber does a demo? I don't see any questions coming on through Twitch at this time. So I think you can just go jump into the demo. Awesome. So to build the thing, um, this one, I have several different options. It's a choose your own adventure for the end of the presentation. Um, I have a link to the Google folder. Again, um, you head to twinery.org. You choose to use it online and I'll show you in a minute um, what I mean by that and start your own game. So that's what I'm gonna do. So this is twinery.org. Um, it just updated last week. So I'm still orienting myself to this new look. Um, but on here, you can see you've got an option to download the desktop app or use it in browser. I recommend using it in browser for um, outreach events where you're having patrons create their own content, super convenient. Um, if you are intending to create content to distribute, I would definitely recommend downloading to the desktop app. Um, this is one of those examples of me like barging into a project and doing no background research for the first like month I was building all in the desktop app um, with or building it all in the browser without realizing that like if I cleared my cache um, for my history like my games would be gone um, so I definitely recommend downloading the desktop app if this is something you're looking to use there are a couple of different things on this site that could be really useful. There's the Twine cookbook that I talked about um, and the Twine reference guide, um, but there are also the community aspects here. So Twine Discord, um, you could join the interactive fiction community forum is great. Um, there's also a really active Twine community on Reddit where I've gone to ask questions before. Um, so it's definitely a community where you can go and be like, here's the problem. Um, You'll learn pretty quickly there are things they want to know like what story format you were using it's a big first time error if you're like i'm trying to do a thing and can't figure it out they're like you haven't told us what story format you're using so we can't help you um that is these here harlow is your default so if you start online if you download the app harlow is your default um i use sugar cube um, that is what the Adam Hammond guide recommends. Um, it does require you to know a little bit more coding. You don't need to know any coding for Harlow, um, but you get a little bit more control over the game that way. So to show you how to use it, log in and this is what it looks like. Um, you can click here to start a new story, title it, and then you create it. And this is what the back end looks like. Um, to get started, this little rocket ship will show me. So I double click and it's got all of your text options here, color options. Um, and then you just start typing. Anytime you want to make something clickable, if you want to like make decisions for your players, you just put them in double brackets. Um, Dinosaurs, put those in brackets, or meet aliens. So when I've created those, you see down here, it's created two new passages, and the text of those is whatever I put in the brackets. So if I go to meet dinosaurs, I can start typing here. Um, air swampy, and cloud crashes, sound from the forest. So that's all it takes to get started in Twine. That is how easy it is to start making your own basic story. Um, from here, you can um, work with your style sheet. So if you want to change the background color of your Twine game, um, if you want to add anything about its appearance, you could do that there. Um, in details, this is where you would change your story format. So I would move to Sugar Cube. Um, it gives you some details about things, tells you where your passages and links are. 
Um, publish to file is how you save games. And this is really important, especially if you're doing the use it online. Um, you would publish to file, it will download your HTML file, and then you can always import that. So if say I was working at Twine in my office, um, and I knew I was gonna be like in a classroom showing people, I could download the HTML file and then import that to an online version of Twine in the classroom if I needed to. Um, and then you can test, play, or proof it. So if I went to play, it'll pop it up and show me what my game looks like so far. Can you see HTML real quick? Yeah. So let me show you, let's say um, you want to import the demo game that I made um, and play with it because you're not really, like it's better if you have something existing to see what it looks like. So if I pull up the example games um, from the Twine or the Google folder that I shared, down here it says, here's the HTML file of the game I made for GameRT. It'll open it up like this. I download it. Then I can go back to Twine, um, go to library and import, choose file, the demo. Oh no, this is what happens. I haven't used this new version of Twine. So that's fun. So if that's something you're interested in, let me know. Maybe, oh, there it is. Just had to leave it and come back. Um, so now you have access to the entire back end of the game that I created. Um, so you can see like this looks very different because I'm in Sugarcube and not Harlow. Um, so you can go through and see this is all the stuff that I typed in um, to make the game work. So. Uh, let's see, here is the text box I use to ask your name. Um, and you can see like the variable name here. So you can see where I asked it to use that name again. Um, one thing I do as a Twine creator is I just go back to games where I've used something, an element before. Um, so if I linked to an external website, if I asked for a text box, I'll just go back to the game where I created it, copy and paste it into the new game, um, which is why it can be so helpful. This is an open source, like easily shareable tool. Um, what coding language does it require? I've only used HTML and CSS, um, and I've been able to do a lot with that. I don't know if it gets more fancy than that, to be honest. Um, I was going to try to see. The Twine cookbook will kind of show you the difference between the different stories. So HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, <coughs> and there are like whole databases of different macros and stuff to use with Twine. Are there any other questions about like getting started with Twine? Can't see what this window is. Oh, it's my HTML. So I kind of envisioned the last part of this to be just people. The difference between Sugarcube and Harlow, um, I'm sure there's a technical way to put it. Harlow is going to be one that I would use for beginning users. Um, so if like you're hosting an outreach event, Harlow is the most user friendly. So you don't have to use code to indicate like italics or bold. Um, the only thing you need to be able to do is use your double brackets, like even your macros, like if I can click it here and it's going to walk me through how to do this really easily. Whereas <clears throat> in SugarCube, you do that all yourself. So if you answered the question correctly, the cat sits up and gives you the key. Um, if you didn't answer the question correctly, the cat stares at you unflinchingly. Um, whereas if I were doing that in Harlow, it's a little easier. It's broken down for me and it will generate that code. Um, 
I started out using Harlow um, and I couldn't really, I was having trouble with using images. Um, I didn't understand what an internal file structure was because to be clear, I went into this not knowing what CSS was, what's the difference between HTML and CSS. I went in building blind. Um, and so I started out in Harlow and I could get some images to work, but I couldn't get all of my images to work. Um, so then I went back and watched this Adam Hammond guide to Twine and he explained how to set up an internal file structure in SugarCube. And since that's what I needed, that's the format I use. The big difference is Harlow is more user friendly. SugarCube, you actually have to use the CSS and the HTML yourself, um, but that gives you greater flexibility over what you can do. Any other questions, comments? All right, well, I kind of envisioned the last bit um, being people, if you want to dive into Twine now um, and start, I'm here to answer any questions that come up. Um, if you want to, download the uh, sample game and kind of play around with it. You can come in and see like, if I go to story and style sheet, you can see this is where I picked my background color. So you could change that to a different background color. Let's say I want it blue. And now I want to see what that looks like. I can see that didn't turn blue at all, so that's fun. Um, if you want, I can share another game where I used images. So this first game here, um, I created to show my coworkers um, different ways that you could use Twine for instruction. Um, so a simple version and a slightly gamified version. Um, and this was just a silly one I did um, to demonstrate, like, you could ask students to be reflective here. I am good at literature reviews. I'm bad at citations. I'm good with IRB. I used sound. Getting a 404 error. Interesting. <clears throat> Let me make sure I've got the sharing set up. Okay. Liz, let me know. I did have that set so only people at UNLV could see it. So, excellent. But this is a way to demonstrate like how you could gamify some of these things. Um, you get points for everything you said that you were confident in as a researcher. I can explore things I said I'd like to learn more about. So I showed that you can embed videos, link to external information. And now I've leveled up and it's keeping score of how many skills I said I'm good at. I get a fun picture and fun noise each time I go through. Um, and you can also, if there are twine games that you've really enjoyed, um, if you want to go out and find them, they did, like I said, at the, um, I guess I forgot to point it out on the main page, they do have twine game examples. Um, so this is something that I will play occasionally just to see, like, are there any fun interactive elements that I haven't found? Um, and I can see what it looks like and go Google and figure out how they did a cool thing. Um, there's one that's called, like, am I bisexual enough? And they have a progress bar um, that tracks, like, how you're doing with your awareness and acceptance of your bisexuality. Um, and I was like, oh, I've never seen a progress bar. That's really cool. Um, so I also recommend playing a bunch of different games. Some of them are like not safe for work, um, but some of them like the day after chemo, that one is a really effective 
simple game. Some of them look like nothing I would recognize as twine um, if I didn't know that's what they'd built it in beforehand. Are there any questions, anything people would find helpful to go over? Um, for the intro game that you had us do at the, the very beginning, you had um, slides that loop back. Can you show how you get um, decisions to loop back to previous, um, like how, how those are connected when you're looping back? Yeah, um, so again, this will be in SugarCube. Um, in Harlow, I think it's pretty much the same way. Um, but this is the back end for that game. And you can kind of see with errors, it represents the relationship between different passages. Um, with this game, I used a lot of if macros, so checking your inventory. So you'll see when you start, uh, has silver key and has gold key are set to false. Um, and as you interact with different things, um, let's see, where do you get, you walk up to the shrub, um, this one just gives it to you, so I set has silver key to be true, and then you can kind of, depending on if you've already gone and gotten the gold key, or if you've already gotten the bronze key, it will show you the options that are remaining. Um, if you go to the table, for instance, if you have all of the keys, so if all of these are true, then you've won. If that's not true, it will send you back to any of those. And I could have added code so it like showed you places to go based on what you already had. Um, that was a little more complex than I wanted to get into with this demo. Um, but yeah, it's just, that one's a really easy if macro. Awesome, thank you. And then Liz has a question. Um, she says, I'm interested in how to share games people make if I'm hosting a program teaching them how to make Twine games. Would you need to download the HTML file and make those available or have participants upload them to the Twine website? Um, you could do it two ways. So you could do something I've done in the past, which is uh, I've made a copy of that Twine Google resource folder and I added a folder specifically for others to upload their HTML file in. So when they were done, I just asked them to publish to file and upload that HTML file to um, that Google Drive so anybody could just download it and access it from there. Um, you could also have them add it to a Google site, which is what I've done. That is pretty easy to do. Um, let's see if I can pull up my drive. So if I want to make a sample game, I create a Google site. And then you just click embed and embed code. And um, that HTML file, all that text, you just copy and paste it here. And it will put it into um, just onto the web page like this. Um, there, it's a little different when you have an internal file structure. So if you use um, Images and sound. I don't remember how I did it. I obviously did it for this game. Um, I think I used Netlify, um, which kind of packaged everything in one. This is where my lack of like understanding of tech comes in. I'm like, I don't know. I just Googled it and it worked. Um, but yeah, if you hosted a program teaching them to make twine games, I would say either asking them to just publish to file and send you that HTML file so you could open it up yourself later. Um, or if you wanted to kind of make a showcase of them, you could do that with something like Google Sites or anywhere where you can just embed the HTML directly. Awesome. Any other questions for Amber or anything else you want to see? Oh, uh, Liz also says, do you know if the games are screen reader accessible or if there are other accessibility features? Yeah, and um, they are screen reader accessible. I have run some of my games through um, screen readers just to see if there were any problems. The only thing I've encountered with the level of complexity I use is that sometimes the text boxes aren't named for the screen reader. Um, and so that has been kind of a glitch. Um, that uh, interactive fiction Accessibility report has a lot more details on that. Um, 
I don't think there are any accessibility features as such built into Twine though. Of course. I like to talk about Twine a lot. I'm very enthusiastic, but like expertise is not, is not high. I still don't know that I could fully explain to you, you know, the difference between HTML and CSS. Just kind of follow what I find online. So it is very like beginner level approachable. All right, well, I'm not seeing any other questions coming through. Um, do you have, you, can you throw up your contact? Uh, of course. Slide again, just so folks can get that. Yes, I've got my email and Twitter and I am, I'm a person who cold emails people all the time to be like, you made a really cool twine game, you wanna chat about it. So I'm more than happy to be on the receiving end of that. If um, you find out you wanna get started with it or you wanna chat about other things, academic library game related. So definitely do please feel free to reach out. And if anybody wants to carry the conversation on, you can also do that on our Discord channel, which Amber is also on. Um, I'll throw the link for that in the chat again. Um, but then we can have like a more group conversation because if you have questions, other people likely have the same question. <laughs> so it's nice to sometimes have a group convo about it. Um, but yeah, so this has been great, Amber. I am actually really excited about digging into this. I, I, I'm starting to like, get some ideas for how this could be fun for like summer reading stuff and choose your own adventure and all kinds of stuff or like having my my uh, kids rpg club do some game design of their own with this would be yeah. really fun too <laughs> yeah that's really exciting yeah so uh yeah if anybody has any questions definitely again feel free to reach out to amber join us on discord and chat there um, otherwise, we will look forward to seeing hopefully uh, most of you next Tuesday at our uh, To Build a Mystery event. I'm going to put in chat those links again for our upcoming events and our social media spaces. And then I'm going to put the link to the slides one more time as well. Um, and don't forget, uh, you can save the chat from this session if you want to access it before you get access to the recording um, in the chat area. If you click on the three little dots uh, and click on save chat, you can save today's chat so you have all these links without having to copy and paste it all somewhere else. Um, but thank you again, Amber, so much for teaching us about Twine and all the different ways you can use it. I know I'm looking forward to digging into this, so hopefully some of our viewers today are as well. Excellent. Thank you guys for your time and participation. All right. Enjoy the rest of your Friday and have a great weekend, everybody. Bye.